Today on the Biz Chat, I'm talking about how to close that next big pitch. Hey, I'm Kyle Racky, and today I'm talking about pitching the next big deal, whether it's for a client or it's an investment pitch for your startup. Uh, you know, at some point you're going to be in a room with somebody who you need to extract money from and you need to be able to communicate the idea of uh, they will get a return on their investment and have them say yes and hand you a check. And that is a tall order. It's something that a lot of people fear and have anxiety about. And so I'm going to lay out some information that's going to hopefully make uh, you more confident in your next pitch and, and make you realize that it's not just all about information. It's about how you frame the pitch and how you uh, position yourself uh, before, during, and after the pitch. So, first of all, I want to talk about uh, Pitch Anything. It's a book written by Oren Claff. I read it, I think, on a plane from San Francisco to the East Coast. It was a fairly short read, and I'm a very slow reader, but the information contained in it is extremely helpful. It's written by a guy who's basically an expert pitch guy. He's the guy that people hire to pitch million dollar, even a billion dollar deals. And so he lays out his framework for pitching and even speaking to neuroscientists and getting their take on how the brain is wired. So it's got a lot of really interesting ideas in it, ones that I still use today. First of all, he talks about frames. So Every time that you're in a, a meeting with somebody, or especially if you're in a pitch scenario with a client or with an investor, there's this unspoken power struggle that's going on. So he talks about everybody having their own frame. You can think of it as like a bubble or an aura, your persona, how you're perceived by everybody else. And that the, the larger the frame, the more powerful frame always wins. It always gets what it wants. You might think about being in a room with a wealthy investor. They might have a bigger frame in terms of they feel more powerful. And this is reinforced every time you have to sit in a waiting room and wait 15 minutes. They're 15 minutes late, uh, talking to their receptionist, going into their office on their turf. These are all things that undermine your own frame, make you seem inferior, make you seem like the beta. And so the gist of his argument is that in order to have a bigger power frame, you need to assert your dominance over the situation. The way that you do that is through what he calls local star power. So local star power you could think of, the example he gives is a waiter at a fancy restaurant. So the waiter, the maitre d' might be more uh, inferior in the sense that they're in a lower position, they're the one waiting on you, they're the one um, serving you. You are the, the customer with the money, and yet a really good waiter or maitre d' can assert their dominance over the situation by taking command of the experience, showing their knowledge of the menu, kind of razzing you a little bit, maybe making the guests laugh, um, just really being the local star. So that's kind of what he talks about. You need to assert that same kind of persona when you're giving a pitch so that even if outside of the pitch scenario, the other person is more powerful than you, you can still have local star power, you can have them eating out of your hand. A good way to do this is to actually make them work to impress you. So oftentimes people sit back and watch a pitch and it's all about you trying to win them over. And, you, and this is reinforced when you say things like, thank you so much for having me, uh, thank you for taking the time out, it's an honor to be able to you know, be involved in this pitch. All you're kind of doing in that scenario is telling the client, hey, you're better than me. Uh, and then this sort of increases the size of their own frame and then they have the power to say yes or no or makes them just turned off completely because they feel like you're too needy and uh, you're appealing to them. So, you know, being able to have the confidence and the authority to show that you're worth it, that uh, you are in high demand, other people want your services or your, you know, other people want in on this deal, you know, here it is, but if you're not interested or you don't have the time, that's fine, I've got plenty of work over here. So all the ways that you can communicate can sort of increase the size of your own frame. A really good example to look at this is uh, Tyrion Lannister in Game of Thrones. Uh, I know most people watch Game of Thrones, for those who haven't, Tyrion Lannister is played by Peter Dinklage. 
and he is uh, shorter in stature. He's hated by a lot of members of his, even his own family, and yet he always seems to be the most dominant personality in a room. Even if other people can fight better than him, they're, they're more powerful uh, in terms of they're maybe a king or queen or they just have more physical dominance. He, through his personality, his smarts, his wit, his charm, uh, he always seems to have the bigger power frame in this situation. So watch a couple of scenes with, with Tyrion Lannister and you'll know exactly what I'm talking about. The next thing I want to talk about is how the brain is wired to receive information. So this is in Pitch Anything where Oren Claff talks about how most of us, when we think about a pitch, we think about the information. We think that all somebody cares about is dollars and cents and what they're getting. And really this is the furthest from the truth. In actuality, uh, when we're pitching, we're pitching to a part of the brain that really doesn't understand logic or information. It only understands binary information and emotions. This is what he calls the croc brain. It's also known as the reptile brain. It's kind of the core part of your brain, the oldest um, part of it in terms of evolutionary sense that really only, it only deals in survival instinct. It deals in, is this scary? Can I eat this? Will this hurt me? And so the part of the brain that absorbs information like the neo, is, the, is called the neocortex. It's the part of the brain that handles logistics, linguistics, mathematics, complicated things. The, the, the thing about the brain though is that it is lazy and it tries to minimize the amount of work it needs to do. The neocortex takes up a lot of energy to use to be able to handle all this complex logic and math. And so the first part of the brain that actually responds to things is the croc brain. And if it passes the croc brain test, then your brain kind of signals to move it up through the hierarchy to the neocortex. So what this means in a practical sense is that when you're pitching somebody, they're not really listening to you with uh, their full attention. And so to get their attention, to get them intrigued and to start really thinking about the, the more practical parts of your pitch, you need to first appeal to the croc brain. Again, the croc brain only deals in fear uh, and other binary emotions. I remember a pitch coach once told me that investors only have two emotions, fear and greed. And what you need to do in your pitch is minimize their fear and maximize their greed. It's actually very similar to how the croc brain operates. Uh, Oren Claff talks about the croc brain uh, being concerned with what's new or novel. So anything that seems like you've, I've heard this before, there's nothing new here. The brain kind of turns off and doesn't really listen to the rest of the pitch. So one thing that you need to do is sort of make yourself uh, seem like this is new, this is interesting, this has never been done before, this is a whole new way of thinking about things. And when you position your pitch that way, that signals to the croc brain, okay, I, I want to start listening to this more closely while also minimizing the fear. So in terms of the actual meat of the pitch, I'm not gonna go through a lot of that because obviously it all depends on your unique situation. But I will say this, try to employ storytelling more in your pitches. So often we go in with the hard facts, the cost, the services, what we're gonna deliver. And the way the brain is wired to receive information through the years has been traditionally through storytelling. Uh, if you watch a pitch, especially on uh, Mad Men, for example, with Don Draper, one of the best pitches I've ever seen on that show was when Don Draper was talking about the carousel. They were gonna change the name of the Kodak wheel to the Kodak carousel. And instead of just going in with hard facts and figures like st uh, statistics show that uh, product names with the letter C do better than names with you know the letter W or whatever that information is, he went in with a story and he talked about how nostalgia is, uh, you know, it means pain from an old wound in Greek and it, you know, taking us back to childhood when we're on a carousel and life is simpler and we're remembering our old, uh, our old times and time with our family. And he d delivers this beautiful pitch and it gets people in the room crying and, and uh, it ends up winning them over. So the more you can employ storytelling into your pitches, the more success you'll have. But of course, you also need to frame the pitch the right way from the beginning and frame yourself. The, the closing part I will talk about is employing time frames. This also serves to build up your power frame. So when you 
end the pitch with the client by saying, okay, well, let us know when you've made a decision or what do you think, can we do this deal? You're again signaling neediness, which turns the buyer off or the client off. Instead, what you need to do is employ a time frame and say, um, by next Friday, I need to have a decision on this because I've got other clients waiting. We're trying to plan out our schedule. We've only got so many cycles. So if I don't hear from you by next Friday, I'll assume, I'll assume there's no deal and we're gonna move on. And by doing that, again, you're asserting that power frame, that dominance, and you're also um, making it more likely that the client's gonna make a decision and you're not gonna have this pipeline full of proposals that you don't know whether or not they're gonna close and you've gotta do follow-up. You can really just take a stand and say, I need to know by then, and if I don't hear from you, I'm moving on, and really stick to it, which is the hard thing to do. I hope this information was valuable when you're doing your next pitch. Uh, if you've got any feedback, I'd love to hear it in the comments. Uh, be sure to like, subscribe, and share this with people you know. Thank you so much for watching this, and take care. 